All right, folks, uh, let's get going. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're starting a few minutes late, but we'll finish before 5. Um, as you know, uh, we've had uh, two panels already, which is it's sort of a, a conference within a conference, because we had uh, interest uh, about how is MIT thinking about it, uh, about the future of education. Uh, we had the task force on the future of education. Uh, we had a recent report come out called the Online Education Policy Initiative. Uh, after my talk yesterday, a couple of you asked me for references for some of the day, um, uh, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, learning science stuff I showed. So if you search for OEPI, Online Education Policy Initiative, and MIT, you'll find a reference to a report that we uh, recently released, was funded by the Carnegie uh, Corporation of New York. Um, so with that, we get into the third of the sequence of three panels. The first one was future of the university. The second one was the future of faculty as MIT sees it. And the third is on the future of pedagogy. And um, you've, over the course of both my talk and some of the panels, you've seen a, f seen a bit of how we think of, uh, of learning and pedagogy. Um, if I could ask that we go to the neutral slide here, because uh, Kathy's going to speak after Krishna. So with that, uh, I'd like to kick things off. Um, we have four really exceptional uh, panelists in this panel. I'm really thrilled that they both agreed to participate um, and um, uh, thrilled that we could get this sort of constellation of folks. Um, so I I'll introduce, I'll be, I will go in the, order, in the following order. We'll start with uh, the chair of our faculty, uh, Professor Krishna Rajagopal. He's a professor in physics. And um, Krishna uh, got his uh, bachelor's in physics at Queen's College. He got his PhD at uh, Princeton. He, he, he was a junior fellow at Harvard. He, is, um, he has been at MIT for uh, now uh, approaching two decades. But uh, he's also one of the more decorated teachers at MIT. He's a MacVicker fellow. And he also has a very important role within our faculty, which is we have 1,000 faculty members. I'm one of them. We have three more faculty members here. He is the chair of our faculty. So um, Krishna can also represent or talk about how faculty think about um, the future of pedagogy. So with that, I'll ask Krishna to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So as chair of the MIT faculty, as Sandre said, my charge is to represent the perspectives of 1,000 MIT faculty members. And that's impossible. Um, and as a member of this panel, I've been charged with telling you about the future of pedagogy, which is also impossible. Um, since, as Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, I'm going to look at how the MIT faculty have been inventing the future of pedagogy, both in the past and in the present. So the focus on pedagogy here goes back to the very beginnings of MIT, to its founding in 1861 by William Barton Rogers. He was our first president. He was also MIT's first professor of geology. He was also MIT's first professor of physics. And he was one of the earliest advocates of teaching by the laboratory method, quoting him, to impart a thorough knowledge of the fundamental principles and to conduct the more strictly practical instruction under the guidance of those primary truths. Um, this became MIT's motto, mens et manus. So going back to Rogers, it's vital that students get hands-on experience as well as learning concepts. This seems totally obvious today, but in 1861, it was very much the future. Um, how this future actually turned out was determined by the creativity, by the energy, by the vision, by the passion of some of MIT's earliest faculty members in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, William Ware launched the first ever architecture program in the United States. And if you go to the MIT library, you can find the, um, the bill for his trip around the world where he picked up apparatus for the first laboratory class in architecture. Charles Eliot, whom we later shipped to Harvard, and Frank Stover um, taught the, were the first ever to implement the groundbreaking idea that chemistry students, what we would now call chemistry majors, should actually do experiments. Edward Pickering um, launched the first teaching laboratory in physics. He was the author of the first lab manual ever published. And um, according to Pickering, these ideas caught on quickly in the more progressive colleges. So um, leaping ahead to my second example, we'll leap ahead by 100 years. In 1956, a group of university physics professors, um, six of them in fact, and high school physics teachers, led by Gerald Zacharias, Francis Friedman, Vicki Weisskopf from the MIT faculty, plus three others from around the country, formed the Physical Sciences Study Committee, or PSSC. Um, their goal was reforming high school 
physics education, physics teaching, so as to stimulate students' interest, so as to teach them how to think for themselves, and so as how to, in effect, implement the men's at Manus that Rogers had introduced at MIT 95 years earlier. Um, their timing was impeccable because um, they launched their effort one year before Sputnik, which really galvanized their program. And via the enormous efforts of very many people over the coming decade, Zach and Francis and their team produced textbooks, they produced lab kits, experimental apparatus, they produced teacher manuals, and they produced 50 film strips, actually more than 50 film strips, and these spread far and wide. I can testify that they spread far and wide because when I was a high school student in 1982 and 1983 in an average suburban Toronto high school, the north part of Toronto, a public high school, um, I learned physics from a PSSC book, doing experiments with apparatus that looked identical to what I saw in the pictures in the book. Um, and I watched film strips, including John King, whom I later met here late in his life, in his 1928 Bugatti demonstrating acceleration. And I still remember that today. Um, these films were a key part of Zach's vision. Um, this vision was very much influenced by Edwin Land, um, the inventor of the Polaroid camera. Zach and Land and the others of that day were, I would say, very much ahead of their time. If you look at their film strips, you'll agree that they were ahead of their time. But the vision that they had of interspersing videos into a high school classroom has now been realized for real by um, our own Dick Larson with Blossoms, wherever Dick is. I've lost sight of him. Um, so in each of these cases, the technology of that day was being used to liberate, to enable, to realize a pedagogical vision. And the important thing was the pedagogical vision. Um, and also in each case, a part of this vision was fueled by the energies of the MIT faculty. So what's happening here now? You've gotten a sense of this yesterday and today already. There are a thousand of us, probably with almost that many visions for the future of pedagogy. Um, in this panel, you're going to hear Kathy Drennan's vision for the um, teaching of chemistry at the university level. And you're going to hear from Mitch Resnick, the K-12 level. Um, parenthetically, to introduce Mitch, um, my 11-year-old son is bitterly disappointed not to be here today. This has nothing to do with me. He really couldn't care less about missing the opportunity to hear me speak. Um, but what he really wanted to do was just simply to see Mitch Resnick. Mitch is a hero of my, in the eyes of my son and many other 11-year-olds for creating Scratch, which I hope he'll mention. In fact, I'm not supposed to leave today without getting Mitch's autograph. <laughs> so um, I can't tell you all the futures of pedagogy that the other 998 MIT faculty not on this panel are thinking about, and that's kind of my point. Um, it's bred in the bone here from the very beginning that MIT faculty innovate in how to teach. Um, and it's also bred in the bone that their energies in this regard are directed both inwards to teaching MIT students and outwards. So I do want to run through um, a series of examples that are closer to the present. Many of them have to do with using technology to flip the classroom. So let me give you my take on what flipping the classroom actually means. Um, Flipping the classroom to me is not about the technology that enables the flipping, it's about the flipping itself. It's about improving the learning that happens in the classroom, that's the whole point. By making that learning more active, by um, getting the students actively engaged in their learning in the classroom itself. Um, one way of describing what this is, is scientists and engineers like me, um, learning how best to use the classroom time from people like historians and philosophers who've always taught this way. Um, another way of saying what flipping the classroom is, is it's applying the logic of William Barton Rogers to the men's half of men's at Manus. It's doing what Rogers brought to the Manus half to the men's half. Um, here at MIT, flipping the classroom goes back at least to 1969 with the Experimental Study Group, or ESG, which is led today by Lee Royden. It's 50, this is today, it's 55 students who form a learning community and, and learn all of their freshman subjects together. And if you watch, the way they learn is typically in small groups of three students at a chalkboard working together with a TA who's maybe one or two years more senior than they are with an instructor a bit in the background. Um, 15 years ago, one of the ESG instructors, Peter Dramashkin, and John Belcher, my colleague in physics, figured out how to scale this up to the scale of um, um, the, the overall MIT student population. They created technology-enabled active learning pedagogy that now works in a physics classroom with 100 students. 
100 freshmen, five undergrad TAs, one grad TA, and one instructor like for the last couple of years, me. Um, teaching in Teal is a lot like teaching anywhere else. It's about creating a narrative arc for your students. It's about inspiring them. It's about giving them context, giving them motivation. It's just the way you do this is a little bit different. You do it with five to 10 minutes nuggets of the things that I just said, interspersed with the students doing the derivations themselves, the students doing the problems themselves, working in groups of three with those undergrad TAs and grad TAs helping. Students doing experiments, students debating um, questions that you threw at them using clickers, as Kathy is going to describe. Um, and by the end of your class, you've brought them through the beginning, the middle, the end of the story you were trying to tell them. And the difference is that you actually know whether they've come with you because you've been engaged with them and they've been active. Um, over the past three years, John Belcher and Deepto Chakrabarty and Safe Ryan and Peter Damashkin and many, many others have used MITx technology to, um, in this context, improve what the, these students are doing outside the classroom, um, providing them with online videos, and providing them with online problems that have allowed further, have further improved what they do outside the classroom and that has allowed further improvements inside the classroom. But actually the big step was the flipping in the first place. I could tell very similar stories about the efforts of Albert Meyer, who has flipped our class in mathematics for computer science. You heard yesterday from David Darmafall on his aerodynamics experience. And you heard from Denny about the work of him and Leslie Cabling and many others um, developing a flipped um, class on electro electrical engineering and computer science. Um, or in quite a different vein, I could tell you about the blended learning efforts of Gunther Rowland and Sean Robinson in the laboratory for MIT junior physics majors that still has hanging on the wall the original sign from the William Barton Rogers physical laboratory that Edward Pickering created in 1868. Um, Gunther, in that very room, Gunther and Sean have put all their instruction on curve fitting and data analysis online now so that the students in lab spend their time doing what they should be doing in lab, um, doing the data analysis itself. The, the learning how to do the data analysis is now done online. So the examples I've mentioned so far were inward facing examples where we've, we, the MIT faculty, have been coming up with new ways to energize how we teach on campus. There are also many examples that are simultaneously inward and outward facing, and I'll give a couple. Um, Shigeru Miyagawa, together with colleagues at Harvard, University of Tokyo, and Duke, has created a three MOOC X series called Visualizing Japan. It goes from the 1850s to post-war Tokyo. And this is a truly global collaboration. It offers cutting edge pedagogy built around hundreds of historically significant images. And at all four universities, together, but at four universities, um, these instructors have used the X-Series material to facilitate the flipping of their classrooms and the creation of a global community of, of the students in these four universities. Tom Koken, former chair of the, and, and all of these are MOOCs, so all of these are being used by people all around the world in lots of different ways, in addition to the ways they're being used to flip classrooms um, here at MIT and elsewhere. Tom Koken, a former chair of the MIT faculty, just finished teaching a MOOC called Shaping the Future of Work. And what he did, he has deep connections into the US labor movement, and he reached out to a diverse population of, work, of workers around the United States and created a MOOC involving them and MIT Sloan MBA students to the educational benefit of both, and hopefully to the benefit of the future of work itself. Um, different kind of example, Lorna Gibson, another former chair of the faculty, um, Barton Swiebach, Wolfgang Ketterle, and others. Wolfgang is a Nobel laureate. All three of them have taught MOOCs, outward facing MOOCs, um, respectively on mechanical behavior materials, quantum mechanics, and atomic physics. So videotape lectures, online problems. Um, and at the same time, they've taught on on-campus group of students who have got the online instruction and in-person instruction in a small classroom, group of 20 students say, with the professor whom I just named. Um, these MIT students really like this new mode. Um, they like the in-person recitations, but at the same time, they like the flexibility of the online lectures. We don't know if they use the fast forward or the rewind button. We don't know where they watch the lectures. Um, and they like the online problems, which give them instant feedback. The big advantage here from our perspective and the student's perspective is that in the old days, you hand in a problem set, it's a week before you get it back, by which time, whatever the grader has written on it is never read. Um, 
and with, in the online mode, you get instant feedback and additional learning. So Lorna, Barton, and Wolfgang are all um, leaders at MIT by their actions, and it's quite telling that they're each, Lorna and Barton are each now developing their second such subject, and um, since I'm a physicist, I happen to know that at the physics faculty lunch about three weeks ago, um, Wolfgang was asked about this, and he said he thought that what he, the way he's teaching this semester is better than the way he's taught in the past. Um, and when Wolfgang says something like that, other physicists listen. Um, so I had one more example, which I will skip because I'm over time already. Um, and as colleagues see colleagues doing these experiments successfully, they jump in. So where is all this going? What's the future of pedagogy? Well, I don't know. Um, there will be many futures. Um, in a recent survey of the MIT faculty, it's done once every four years, one of the questions on it was to ask, do you, do you wish that you were using more technology in your teaching than you are now? 38% said yes. Um, so I don't know where we're going, but we are going. Um, and our history shows that um, this, these new, these, this experimentation, this, this spirit of, of innovation um, will liberate and enable pedagogical innovations that point both inwards and outwards. So although I don't know what the futures of pedagogy are, um, I do know from our past and from our present that many will be catalyzed by the energies of the MIT faculty. Thank you. Thank you. So I think in the interest of time, we'll go to the next presentation, and then I will uh, do a couple of, uh, we'll do Q&A, we'll sort of intersperse it. Our next speaker is Professor Catherine, uh, Kathy Drennan. Uh, Kathy got her uh, bachelor's at uh, Vassar. She got a PhD at Michigan. And then she, she was at Caltech as a postdoc for many years. She's a professor of both chemistry and biology, and her research is both on um, um, metalloenzymes, um, uh, molecules that involve metals inside uh, biological systems, but also in education. And before it became, uh, dare I use the term, glamorous to talk about education, Kathy was talking about education. So Kathy. Thanks. So I thought I would just share with you a little bit about what we were thinking with technology and, and kind of some of our experiments with how well technology works in the classroom. And then the, uh, the case study is intro chemistry, which is often taught in this room. So um, in terms of technology, I want to talk about one of the most common types of classroom technology, which are these clicker devices. And so if you don't know what some of them look like, one of them is up there. They're kind of credit card size. And so in a lecture, it's really a passive way of presenting information. And so you want to have uh, try to engage students at see if there is misunderstanding and, and get them to stop and sort of think about the material you just presented and answer a question about it. So with these clicker um, devices, um, one can ask a question with a PowerPoint, and, and the students can click in their answer, one, two, three, four, um, up to 10. And then they can see instantly whether they got it right, see whether they got it wrong, but 90% of the class got it right, but not them. And so it's a way to, for the faculty to assess whether students are with them and for the student to do self-assessment. And hopefully, it keeps them engaged. So the first time we tried this in 5.11.1, one of the versions of freshman chemistry, um, I thought it worked pretty well, but the students really disliked it. So I wondered if there's something we could do to help the students engage with this new technology. So let me tell you one of the things we tried, which are these things called clicker competitions. And to understand what these are, you have to understand that in freshman chemistry, it meets five days a week, so three days of lecture and two days of recitation. And the recitation instructors are graduate students in the Department of Chemistry, and here are pictures of 12 of them for uh, one of the years. And so they meet with the students on Tuesday, Thursday for 50 minutes, and they work problems on the board or do various different things to help students really. It's all active learning during the recitations. And so we had this idea that we would have competitions in the classrooms where students in, say, recitation 12 would compete with all the other recitations to see who could get more questions right. And we thought this was also a way for the TAs to really build a sense of team within their recitation. They say, you know, I don't care if you win the whole thing, but I just want you to be um, better than Jay's recitation, because he's my roommate, and he's always bragging about his kids. And clearly, I have the best people in my recitation. So it was a way to kind of create team to encourage people in the recitation to make friends and work together, maybe work more on chemistry outside the classroom with these other people that they had gotten to know. 
So this was the idea. And so what we usually do is on Fridays, we would have clicker competitions. We would use clickers on Monday and Wednesday just about the same amount, but on Friday, we would let people know at the end of the class which recitation had gotten the most answers right. And those people won snacks for the recitation the next week. So we usually start out kind of small with like maybe donut holes, moving up to donuts. And then um, at one point, a student, uh, Marco, his recitation had won so many times, they had him baking cakes for them. They're like, well, if we win, you need to bake us a cake. Um, and uh, then at one point, they still were winning. And they're like, we want you to change your wardrobe. You always wear black. And we think you should wear more colors. And at that point, he's like, no, I'm done. I don't care if you win again. I'm not wearing red t-shirts. Anyway, um, so this was just a way to kind of build a sense of team. And then at the end of the semester, we had uh, clicker competition championships where they would compete for the ultimate prize, which is a one-of-a-kind geeky t-shirt, often designed by myself or students in the class. And these are two of the t-shirts that were designed by students. All right, so how, how well did this work? So we worked with Rudy Mitchell in the Teaching and Learning Laboratory at MIT. Um, he designed surveys to ask um, about the clicker usage and get the students' impressions. We also used the MIT surveys, and he did some one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews also to uh, round out the evaluation. So I was really surprised how well this actually worked. So here I have control versus treatment. Control are semesters where we used clickers but did not have the competition. So we were using clickers during those semesters. And then the treatment is the use of the, of the clicker competitions. And we asked students questions like, did the clickers stimulate me to think conceptually? Um, help me identify my weaknesses. And you see that in the control, they were using clickers. And we said, did it help you think conceptually? 36% said that they agreed it did. But with the clicker competition, we jumped from 36 to 82. So they were certainly getting a lot more out of using these clickers when it was in a semester where we were having these clicker competitions. We ask a bunch of these questions, again, identify weaknesses, 51 to 82. They also liked it better, but we only got up to 67% liking them as opposed to 82 saying that they were really benefiting their education. Um, here are another uh, set of uh, winning students with their geeky uh, Green Lantern type t-shirt. And we got a bunch of comments also about the use of these clicker competitions. And here's one that said, 511.1 was an enriching experience for me. Basically, I had very little chemistry coming in, which is actually common in this version of, of uh, chemistry here at MIT. People don't have that strong background when they come in. Um, and they said, being able to learn so much and eventually win the clicker competition, plus the wonderfully uh, nerdy Green Lantern t-shirt, I have to say, was pretty awesome. So um, that, that was a lot of fun. So when I've talked about this before, they've said, OK, this works at MIT. MIT people love competitions. This isn't going to work anywhere else. So we thought, OK, let's test that out. So um, I talked to. Uh, an HHMI uh, professor at the University of uh, California at Irvine, Diane O'Dowd. She teaches intro biology at Irvine. UC Irvine is a very big school. They have really huge classes, um, different kind of environment, and it's biology, not chemistry. So we said, will, will this clicker competition, they were already using clickers, will a competition work in this environment again? So what Diane was able to do, because she has many uh, different classes of the same sort of sections of the same basic class, and she teaches multi them, multiple ones. So she was able to split students into two groups. Both used clickers. One had competition. One did not. Same faculty, same TAs, same exams, everything the same, except one group was using the clicker competitions. Um, she picked um, as the treatment group students that had a little bit lower um, math and SAT scores uh, than uh, the control group. So what was the results? Well, she analyzed this for many different things. One thing we were interested in knowing was about student interaction. Because we wanted to see whether these competitions would build that sense of team, whether the students were working together outside of the classroom. And she did find that there was much more student interaction with the groups um, that were using the clickers. So it was building study partners and other things outside the class. And something that we hadn't been able to ask at MIT, which was, what about grades? Um, and they actually found um, 
that in the quarter grades, about a third of a letter grade difference, this treatment group did a third of a letter grade better, and they were the ones with the, the lower test scores um, coming into the class. So again, this is like one day a week, we make it a competition. You're not really doing anything different than you did before. Um, and this is a very small change, but it's a way to kind of engage students with the technology that's available. So um, that's my, my story about clickers for today. You know, you heard the chair of MIT's uh, faculty to give a very eloquent description of the history and um, the work of many of our colleagues. What I hear from uh, Kathy is, you know, I, I'm always struck by this, is it's not just the motions, not just going through the motions, it is the outcome. So clickers have been around, people have been talking about clickers. It is the realization that clickers are good, we tried it, not good enough. We're gonna invent that next step to make sure it is the outcome. And I think this is something that goes back to what Dave Damofal said uh, yesterday. It's not just a matter of making it sustainable. It is continuously questioning and going that next step. So it's really inspiring to hear that. I heard Kathy talk about this about five or six years ago, her early experiments in clickers. It's great to see all the progress. Um, the next speaker is, is, uh, is Professor Mitchell Resnick. Um, Mitchell is uh, an MIT man. He uh, did get his bachelor's at Princeton, we forgive him for that, but he did get his master's and his PhD from MIT from course six, course six. You know what that is, course six? EECS, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. As I said, we number everything at MIT. Um, he was then a science journalist, I think in the New York Times? A business Week magazine. Business Week. Um, and uh, then he came back to MIT, and um, he will speak eloquently about something we referred to yesterday, which is the power of the child to be creative and capturing that and basically transforming an entire generation, frankly, including my 13-year-old, who also would prefer to hang out with Mitch Mitchell than me. Mm -hmm. Mitchell. Thank Thanks, Sanjay. Well, the title for my presentation, From A to X, comes from a conversation I had a couple years ago with the president of Tsinghua University in China. And Tsinghua is often known as the MIT of China. And we were talking, and he was telling me about the challenges that he felt he was facing. He said there were two types of students at Tsinghua University. He said he referred to them as A students and X students. And he said that Tsinghua was dominated by A students. And he said A students are the students who study very hard. They know how to do well on the tests. They know how to prepare for the next step, to move on to the next you know, level, and to get on with their careers. Very systematic in the way they go about things. And they'll likely be very successful in many ways in life. But he said it was a problem that there were so many A students, but not enough of what he called X students. And he said the X students are the ones who don't always pay attention to the rules, who will sort of skip classes in order to work on something else that they're interested in. But he said a lot of the most creative ideas came from the X students. So he said his most important challenge as president of Tsinghua was to attract more X students and then to nurture X students or to help students move from A to X so that everyone could become more of a creative thinker. Because he said that's what was going to be the real key to success in people's lives as they left Tsinghua and went out into the world. And as I listened to this, it made a lot of sense to me, but I think it makes a lot of sense not just at Tsinghua University and not just in China, but throughout the world for learners of all ages. I think that's a big part of what I've been trying to do in my work is to see how can we help everyone grow up as a creative thinker. And I think that's more important today than ever in the past. But you know, we're living in a society that's changing more quickly than ever before. Everyone recognizes that. So as children grow up today, we don't really know exactly what's going to await them in the future. But we do know that what will be more important than ever before is the ability to think and act creatively so they can deal with the unexpected situations that they surely will confront in the future. But unfortunately, most schools are not set up to help people develop as creative thinkers, even though that's more important now than ever before. As we've thought about this, how do we help people develop as creative thinkers? And as we see it, 
the root of creative is create. So you want to spend a lot of time creating things, designing things, inventing things. In that process, you'll develop as a creative thinker. Unfortunately, most schools aren't set up that way. In many schools and most learning situations, the pedagogical model is more like this, of someone delivering information from teacher to learner. And oftentimes, the emphasis is on how can we do a better job of delivering that information. And you can get incremental improvements by delivering the information better. And you might get some improvements by having a computer that delivers the information. But I don't think that's the way we're going to help young people grow up as creative thinkers and really prepare them for what's most needed in today's society. So we've been really focused on how can we design new technologies, new activities that will support children becoming creative thinkers. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, one of the projects we've worked on is, is this software called Scratch. It was really designed with this in mind. So with Scratch, it's a way to help young people learn to create their own interactive stories and games and animations, and then share their creations with others online. Just like in this video, you can see a little example of how kids will make a project in Scratch. They'll snap together graphical blocks, somewhat like snapping Lego bricks together, and each of those stacks of blocks will control the behavior of one of the characters in, what, in, your, in your program. In this case, it was a, fish, a, a game where a fish eats, uh, eats other fish. Importantly, there's also a way, after you create your project, to share it with others in an online community. Scratch was the first, pro the first programming language that came out that came with an online community right from the beginning, because we saw that it was critically important we saw that it was critically important that people not only learn to create, but to share their creations with others. So let me just show you some examples of how kids around the world have started to use Scratch. Right now, there's more than 11 million kids around the world who have registered on the Scratch online community. Like this is an example from India. So this is wrong. If you can turn the volume a little. Someone, turn down the volume a little bit. So this is from a school in Bangalore where they were studying the layers of the earth. And this student was giving, a, he created in Scratch a guided tour of the earth. He's giving the guide tour in his native language of Kannada and he's explaining what happens at different layers of the earth. Uh, it was explained to us that he was really fascinated that things are moving inside the earth. He was so surprised that the earth is solid. He was shocked that things are moving inside. So he wanted his program to show that things are moving inside the earth. And he explains the water table and other things moving inside of the Earth. So instead of just writing up a report or doing a standard PowerPoint presentation, he was able to sort of communicate in a dynamic way the things he was learning, but on the process also learning to think systematically in building the computer programs to, to, for this type of dynamic animation. Or here's another example of a student in middle school where they were studying in their history class uh, Rapa Nui, the island of Easter Island off of South America. And what he decided to create was something like Sim Rapa Nui, inspired by Sim City, where he took what he had learned about the history and the culture and the economy and made a simulation game. So since fishing was essential to the economy, if you want to survive in this game, you have to fish. You have to cut down, make a, a fishing rod, fish. If you do that, you'll be able to survive for longer. If you cut down too many trees, the god happiness goes down because he learned from the you know, re religious beliefs there that you know, being uh, recognized the importance of the local environment was important. So it was a way for him to share what he had learned about Rapa Nui, but also then to help other people learn you know, from you know, his presentation. By sharing this in the online community, he shared it with kids around the world. And when you share a project in the online community, you can then give credit. So in this case, he showed that he didn't do this by himself. He gives credit to someone did the soundtrack, someone did the design, someone with the technical assistance. This project got viewed more than 2,000 times. It was loved by nine people. It was made a favorite project by 13. Uh, it had you know, more than 50 comments where people give feedback. And one of the reasons it's so important to have this online community is that you then get feedback and advice from others in the, in the community. Also, someone else remixed it. Everything that's shared in the Scratch Online community is shared under what's called a Creative Commons license, which means everybody else is able to 
take your programming code or your graphics and remix it into their own project. Roughly a third of the projects on Scratch are remixes where people build in each other's work, so there's learning about collaboration. Now, this approach we see is so natural, but it's not the way that most kids are learning to code these days. As many of you know, there's a lot of interest in learning to code these days, but it's usually introduced very differently. It's introduced just to help people learn the computational concepts. And there's some value of learning the computational concepts. And it's often introduced with puzzle situations. Oops, wait, look, before going there, this is just showing some of the variety of different projects that kids do on Scratch. So you can see the wide range of different ways the kids use the Scratch software, uh, that they use it to express themselves in all different ways, whether it's animated stories or interactive birthday cards or different games or interactive artwork. But instead of you know, engaging kids in projects like this, what's most common these days when kids are learning programming is sites like this where they're given puzzles. And again, there's nothing wrong with puzzles, but basically they're given, you know, here's a goal and you have to put together some blocks to get a character from here to there. And it's tried to make more interesting, in this case has you know, some things from you know, different video games. Uh, but in my mind, this is a little bit like teaching someone to read and write by giving them crossword puzzles. Now, I have nothing against crossword puzzles. I love crossword puzzles. Uh, and you can learn vocabulary from crossword puzzles. But if we really want people to grow up to be able to express themselves and be creative, we don't just give them crossword puzzles. We teach them to express themselves through language. And that's what we want to do with Scratch. It's not just about learning programming, but letting everybody, not just developing the thinking skills of how to solve problems, which is important, but also to develop their voice, to, to express their ideas in the world. And we think this is what's so important if we really want young people to develop as creative thinkers. So I want to end by giving you, telling you about the guiding principles that we use as we think about developing technologies and activities to support uh, young people developing as creative thinkers. And we talk about these principles, we call them the four Ps of creative learning. Projects, passion, peers, and play. And these are what guided us as we developed new technologies like Scratch. With projects, we want people to learn how to start with an idea and carry it through to a full project that they can share with others. In fact, most of us in our lives spend a lot of time working on projects, you know, whether it's a journalist writing an article or a marketing manager doing a marketing plan. Those are all projects. We want kids to grow up learning how to take an idea and build it into a project. We know that people are going to learn most if they're working on things they're passionate about, they care about. People are willing to work longer and harder, persist in the face of challenges if they're working on things they're passionate about. One reason I love the variety that you see in the Scratch website is it's an indication that kids are working on things they're passionate about, and we know that's what's going to lead them to work longer and harder and learn more in the process. Peers, we know that people don't just learn by themselves. It's very misleading. The sculpture of the thinker is just by you know, himself. Most learning happens with and from others. So we made Scratch into a community where people learn with and from others. They get inspired by what others make. They get feedback from others. And play. Play is not just about having fun. It's about any, a type of engagement where you're willing to take risks, try new things, test the boundaries. Again, one thing I love about MIT is it's a very playful environment where people are constantly experimenting, trying new things, testing the boundaries. We want kids to grow up with that same sort of experience. So for us, the key, you know, there's, of course, there's a lot of concepts we want kids to learn, but in my mind, there's nothing more important when kids growing up that if they learn how to think creatively and engage with the world in a creative way. And for us, the best way of doing that is to develop technologies and activities guided by projects, passion, peers, and play. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Mitchell. Um, uh, our final speaker is Georgia. Um, Georgia Van de Zand got her bachelor's at MIT. Um, and then she, she's a master's student now working on a very exciting course, actually, uh, called 2009. I think it's what, it's what you're going to talk about. But I've got to say that I met Georgia about a year ago. I gave a talk in uh, a class. It was sort of a more primitive version of the talk I gave earlier uh, yesterday. And so she reached out to me and she said, I have the, all these ideas about uh, how MIT can improve. And uh, I said, why don't you just write an article about it? And she did, in the tech, which is fairly critical of us, actually. And we were all like, that's awesome. So that's why we thought Georgia, uh, 
We'd love to hear you on this panel. I don't think she's going to be talking about that, but feel free to provoke us a little bit. Come on up. Cool. Uh, thanks. I've been learning a lot from everybody uh, here that I've met and to those of you who I haven't. Um, like Sanjay said, I'm a master's student in mechanical engineering here where I also did my undergrad. As a freshman, I wasn't entirely sure where uh, I wanted to major. But then that spring, I took a class called Toy Product Design, in which uh, students work in small groups, about five students, to build and design uh, new toys for kids, which, as you can imagine, is a really fun and engaging way to be introduced into mechanical engineering. So after that, I knew Mechi was the way to go. The professor who teaches that toy class, David Wallace, also teaches another popular class in the Mechi department, for uh, seniors in, their, uh, fall, in the fall of the fi final year. It's called Product Engineering Processes, or two. Jack hasn't shown up. Just give us a second. Sorry about that. No, no, it is. Oh, this is a, it's a blank slide. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> One second. We'll get to the slides. Um, so, yeah, 2009 is a hands on um, class, and it's the best class I've ever taken, probably one of the best ones at MIT. Uh, additionally, last fall, I had the chance to TA for this class, so I got to see some of the staff side as well as the, st as the student side. In 2009, eight teams of 20 students uh, work to develop new ideas. So they start with blank sheets of paper, no prompts or ideas given to them at all, and three months later, they have eight working prototypes that are ready to be pitched to investors. What's so cool about this class is not just the projects that come out of it, but also that the students are so excited and so proud of the work that they develop. They easily put in twice as much time to this class as other classes, um, spending hours in lab, but they don't mind it because they love it. Uh, this excitement also trickles down to their younger friends, some students being excited from freshman year to take this class three years later. And I think three elements really make 2009 the magical experience that it is. And they sort of echo the three Ps that you mentioned. So the first is hands-on learning. In labs, students are always building something, taking something apart, or testing something. Not only do they design and build their final projects in the lab, but um, they tear down successful products to see how they've been designed, and they build contraptions that they'll later race against other students in what we call build challenge, a uh, field day of sorts. This is Rachel, a student who's working with Jimmy, one of the machine shop staff, uh, to put final finishing touches on Blue Team's uh, contraption for Build Challenge. But this hands-on work doesn't just take place in lab. It happens in the same lecture hall where three lectures are held each week. In lecture, students build handheld foam cutters, they dissect pieces of fruit, they build origami balloons, and cheer on team members drilling screws into different arrangements of wooden boards. All these activities show different project parts of the engineering process in really hands-on ways. The second aspect of this class that makes it what it is, is student teamwork. In 2009, students work in teams of about 20 students, which can be really stressful to manage at times, but somehow people end up making a lot of friends. There are a number of team building activities built into the syllabus. One is Build Challenge, which takes place just outside on Killian Court. Here, students race those contraptions they built back in lab to get, from one, to get all their team members from one side of the court to the other, um, racing the whole time. Uh, this is my team, pink team, from two years ago on Build Challenge Day. Uh, and this was one of the most fun days in my undergrad career. I remember um, we, came, we came and got together before, early before lecture. Uh, we built that giant flag, um, cut out pink foam letters, dressed in crazy costumes, and during the race, we were by far the slowest team, <laughs> uh, probably finishing about 10 minutes after the next one. But it was really fun to get, um, you know, we all cheered for each other, and it was great to support each other, but we also got other teams to help cheer us uh, once they had finished. So it was really powerful to get that kind of encouragement and confidence at the beginning of the semester, uh, so we knew that we could get through any engineering challenges, given our strong teamwork. The last thing, fun. Uh, both these last two elements, the hands-on learning and student teamwork, are innately fun, in my opinion. 
But in 2009, fun leaks its way into every aspect of the class, making it an exciting experience for students and staff alike. Uh, this is Victor, my fellow TA, breaking a fake wine bottle over a professor's head in a lecture to teach about engineering ethics. <laughs> um, our professor also has a full wall of costumes in his office um, that include a princess costume. Looks great with his beard. Um, and he uses these for certain special lectures. Um, but what's the purpose of these seemingly crazy ideas um, like costumes or build challenge? Uh, because engineering innovation and innovation are all about creativity. And to have a truly, truly creative learning environment, there have to be no rules, no preconceptions, and no boundaries. Doing something silly makes a more stimulating environment for creativity. It makes learning more enjoyable. And it makes students all the more enthusiastic about what they're working on. While this class doesn't use any of the great digital technologies we've been talking about the past couple days, um, it does these three aspects, hands-on learning, student teamwork, and fun, really well. And I think many classes, even many other classes at MIT, could work on incorporating more of these elements. Um, a class like 2009 needs a lot of resources and time invested into it. But I hope that soon uh, the adoption of digital technologies into classrooms will allow for more of these elements to be in all students' learning experiences and enhance the ones that are already there. Uh, because as a student, I found that these uh, elements are the most meaningful to me. Thank you. So we're going to follow our usual procedure. If you have any questions, if you wouldn't mind coming down to the mic, I'm going to sort of uh, prime. I have a question. I actually want to put Georgia on the spot. Actually, I want you to put us on the spot. All right. So the question is, what would you change about MIT? What would you like to see different? Um, I think a lot more emphasis on lab work and uh, hands-on activities. Um, we spend a lot of time in lecture and working on problem sets, which I think is really good for learning in the moment. But um, you know, a semester later, uh, you might not remember that because they all kind of blur together. Um, but if you really remember, you know, working on this, you know, chemistry experiment here or doing some you know, test with DNA in your bio class, um, it, I think that would resonate a lot more later in uh, our So careers. more hands-on, more mm -hmm. hands-on. You know, Krishna, you talked about labs. There's the, the famous junior, what's it called, the junior. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so, so the way I would riff on what Georgia said is that the, the way I link, I'll link um, exactly what Georgia said and what has been much discussed here is, is Part of the challenge in many of these examples is thinking about how to do the blending, right? The buzzword is blended learning. Um, and um, at many different scales and at many different levels, we can think about how best to do the blending. So the example that Sanjay's asked me to mention is in Junior Lab, which is it is as hands-on as it can get. It's, it's a lab class for um, juniors who are majoring in physics. Um, it's, uh, the normal class at MIT is 12 units. This is an 18-unit class. It's um, an intense, many hours per week laboratory experience, as hands-on as you can get. But there was this part at the beginning which was deadly dull, which was in a laboratory, having a professor give lectures in the laboratory on error analysis, um, curve fitting, um, how, to, how to analyze data. And that was a dull. Um, it violated the don't speak for more than seven minutes theorem of Sanjay from yesterday. Um, and B, that was not when you needed it, because when you need that was six weeks later when you have your data and you want to analyze it. Um, and it's, it's, it's two o'clock in the morning, which is when MIT students do some of their most creative work, and you want to analyze the data, that's when you need it. So what Gunther and Sean did was to um, make Khan Academy style um, uh, tablet lectures, which were on, um, online, which had all that material. And at the beginning of the semester, in the time that was freed up, they did much more sophisticated, hands-on da data analysis exercises, the lectures having been taken, offline, taken online. So, and then best of all, at two in the morning, six weeks later, you've got the online material. So that's that one. And what I would say is that in, it's re that's one example, but blending 
has been used in so many different ways. The MicroMasters, great example of blending completely different scale because that's thinking about blending an entire year of material, year of work, professional master's student. How do you blend? What's best done online? What, what requires the on-campus experience? How do you blend? Um, the, the MOOCs that I mentioned from Barton and Wolfgang and, and Lorna, Lorna Gibson in material science, um, for their, their success for MIT students on campus, the MIT students in those three classes would not have accepted them if they were just the online class. I apologize to, to Sanjay or to Anant if he's somewhere. No, he's in, not here. You can see he's somewhere, you somewhere in the room. Um, you know, one can imagine, and many of you probably know, students for whom that online experience is 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 an unparalleled opportunity. But for our students, if that's what we gave them, they would be disappointed. What made that work for our students was the combination of that online activity with the three hours a week in a classroom with Lorna, with Barton, or with Wolfgang. Um, and what they all found was that actually it's finding the balance. How do you do the blending? Um, Lorna, I know, for the second time around, she plans to increase the number of hours per week of recitation because what she felt was the online class empowered the recitation and she needed more of it. So, each of you in your own situation, I don't think there's a recipe here except to say that it's, it, I think, very important to think about how to blend all these pieces together. Thank you, Krishna. So, so. Thank you, Darwin. I have two questions, one for Cathy. Uh, we had yesterday that uh, at MIT, you're very good at setting up innovations, but sustaining it, it's another thing entirely. I want to ask that for the pedagogy that you gave us, you talked about, have you actually reached a stage that you formalized it that it could actually be taken and replicated in, in another setting? You know, that's your question. Then to Mr. Scratch, I really enjoyed your presentation and I've known about, I, was, I took one of your moves and it was really eye-opening. I want to ask, what's the future of Scratch? So let's ask, can you repeat, can you summarize the question? Did you understand the question? Okay. Or maybe you can I summarize it? Heard. Yeah. First part, I totally agree. It's like you come up with innovations, but then how can they, you know, sort of, does everyone need to reinvent the wheel or is there a way that other people can use this and sort of pass these ideas along? And um, I, in terms of freshman chemistry here, I'm no longer involved in teaching 511-1, but I know that last fall, at least, the clicker competitions continued and they were highly popular with other faculty in the class. So um, that's one data point. Um, there was one fall since I stopped teaching. Um, but hopefully some of these things, um, when, you get, when you get the best practices out there, other people will be able to use them without a whole lot of new work to kind of investigate what happens. Um, in biology, there is a slight um, difference in how the clicker competitions, they're using it in uh, cell biology, but instead of between recitations, they all have to pick a house of Hogwarts, and yes, there are Slytherins apparently that sign up, and so you click in which house you wanna be in, and then you get points for your house um, by winning clicker competitions. So um, some of this kind of idea has been, has gone along to other places. So, um, but that is absolutely the challenge, and that's why I like it when it's simple, because to do the clicker competition, it's, you don't, you're not really doing anything particularly different. You just have to set up the software to tell you which group won, and you have them click in to what group they're gonna be. So I feel like if you can make it simple enough, then that innovation can take off. And uh, what's the future of Scratch? The future of Scratch. So part of it is about making sure we always reach kids where they're at. That's probably about their technologies and their interests. So we've, in the next generation of Scratch, we're making it much more friendly to mobile devices, which more and more kids are having as their you know, main way of interacting with technology. So make sure that Scratch can be run on different types of mobile devices, but also connecting with kids' interests to make sure that there's pathways that connect to what kids care about. So like right now we have a whole session we're doing on uh, an entrance into Scratch by doing, doing hip hop dance on Scratch projects. Because there's a lot of similarity between choreography and programming. So a lot of kids who didn't imagine themselves being interested in programming could get interested if it connects to their interests, say, in dance. One last thing I'll mention is with the online community, as it's growing so large, we're trying to do more to support sub-communities. 
like language-based subcommunities. So more than half of use of Scratch is outside the United States. So people that speak the same language should be able to have their own subcommunity or, or other types of subcommunities. So to, we're trying to figure out the best way to make sure that people still get the global view and get influenced by all sorts of things around the world, but also can participate in subcommunities. Thanks. Yep. Krishna? Can I add to the answer to the question you asked, Kathy? Um, I think it's a really important question, this question of sustainability. And many people at MIT are thinking about that right now in the context of these um, so many experiments that are happening. You know, so you have Lorna teaching materials, the mechanics of materials this way. Will the next person at MIT, the next faculty member who teaches the mechanics of materials, will they, will they follow? Um, Barton uh, teaches quantum mechanics this way. Will the next person who teaches quantum mechanics use, um, use, use these methods? And it's too soon to answer that question. I think the, the way these things work at MIT is that it happens in a department in the set of collegial interactions among the faculty. Whoever is the successor to Barton teaching that class will talk with Barton and then make her or his own decisions. Um, so, so I think it's a really good question um, um, always. I'll say that with the Teal example, the, the, the um, switching over of how we teach freshman physics from lecture recitation to Teal, which means we, that was an enormous investment made 15 years ago. Um, investment by the provost and president of MIT, investment by the physics professors of MIT, investment of time, investment of money, investment. And, and in many ways, I would say the, the, the way you can tell it succeeded is that th there was a set of founders. There was a provost, but we have a new provost now. You know, there, there were professors. We have, so it's the fact that there are successors teaching that way now that says that it succeeded. So what I would say is that you, you for any of these experiments, one of the best ways of seeing its success is the handoff. Okay, so Kathy talked about handing off to someone in Irvine, California. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a big success. Um, um, Teal, it's been handed off from one group of physics professors to another over 15 years. Um, uh, and it's been kept alive, kept, kept living by being invigorated now with new online technology. With each of these things, the blending this, blending that, will it be a success? You know, wait and watch and see whether it gets handed off. And if it's successful, it will, because a colleague will see a colleague doing it, we'll see they enjoyed it, we'll see they say it was valuable, we'll see the output, and we'll say, I want to try that. And, so I, and that's really important. I think you just coined uh, a new phrase, colleague see, colleague do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, because in the interest of time, we'll take one more question, but perhaps you can come up and ask. Uh, uh, we'll be here in, in the well for a few moments. So. Uh, my question is about group work, so peer collaboration, which I think almost all of you mentioned in your talks. Uh, it seemed like it's an obviously a really important skill to learn and really valuable learning tool and really can be fun for students, but also a lot of times it doesn't work well. Students don't like it. You have a free rider problem. You have the know-it-all problem. Uh, how, can you talk about how you've addressed some of those issues? Whether you do you assign groups, do you let people choose groups? So just, what are some of the best practices that you found there? So maybe I'll ask uh, Georgia, why don't you take a stab at it, both as a participant and now as someone who's teaching the class. Yeah, um, so in this class, um, there, it's teams of 20, so you definitely end up with people that don't do as much work and some people that kind of take on a lot more than um, you know, would be fair, I guess. Um, I guess the one digital technology that we do use a lot is um, team management websites. A uh, student in um, our lab developed one um, that was used this year uh, to you know, assign tasks and manage documents. Um, but other teams have also chosen to use things like Slack. Um, and, but really the teamwork and structure is just up to them. Uh, we kind of tell them, you know, elect two team leaders and two you know, data managers, but after the first lab, it's really up to them for how they want to run it. Um, I think a lot of what they learn from this comes from um, encouragement to, you know, make the best project and have the best team. Um, you don't always get, you know, the best teamwork or, or team dynamics out of a random assignment of students, but I think they definitely still learn a lot even if uh, they don't have the best team dynamics. Krishna? Really important question, and I'll answer it in the context of the groups of three in a teal classroom. Um, all the issues you mentioned arise, and uh, I'll add another one, which is that here at MIT, a very large fraction of our students were the one of the very top in their high school, um, and and now they're all in the middle of the MIT distribution somewhere, um, 
and you realize that your first day in, the, in your teal classroom when you start um, interacting with two other peers. Um, and, and so which makes some of the things that you mentioned um, uh, particularly acute. So the, in the early days, my colleagues um, tried to think about designing, engineering those groups of three in various ways. And then we stopped doing that. We do it, um, um, we do it but let the students self-organize um, um, the first day when they walk in. Um, but then the key thing is, is, is your eyes. And, and so for me, my eyes are not just my eyes. It's my five undergrad TAs and my one grad TA. And I have a weekly meeting with them, and that's a big part of the discussion. They're what, each undergrad TA is watching probably six groups of three. Um, and I, I go group by group, and I ask how well it's working. And I will shuffle if necessary. So, so we don't, we, we try and, so our answer, um, after trying some other strategies early on in the, in the 15 years, is, is, to, is to not try and design it or engineer it from the beginning, just let people sit down, but then to watch carefully and to make changes as needed. So in the interest of time, if you don't mind, I'm going to sort of end here, but maybe I'll, I'll make one sort of uh, summary comment, which is that I don't want to leave the impression that somehow uh, we agree on everything. We don't. Um, I mean, if I may, Mitch has said to me, very politely, he's a very polite man. But basically, is what he said is, I don't like this MOOC stuff. Can we do something completely different? And they did. And they produced something called Unhangout, which we now use in our MOOCs, some of our MOOCs, right? That's completely fine. Divergence is important. Agreement is overrated, especially in the early days. That's point number one. Um, point number two is that um, we may do different things at different times. So not just divergence of ideas, but divergence of you know, sequences and you know, times, et cetera. That's completely fine. There's chaos associated with that. We're fine with that. And um, the third thing is that when, in fact, results emerge, the one thing MIT values more than anything else is or get, you know, some combination of merit and facts. And that's really the best way for things to take off. So I, I don't want to leave the impression that we're somehow sort of sugarcoating uh, a situation where, every, you know, where in fact there's a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of conflict and you know, everything's converged. It's quite the opposite. We have a lot of very intimate, tough discussions about, I think this idea will work. No, I disagree. Well, let's do both, right? We have the resources to some extent that we can do it, but, I conver but forced convergence, in my, in, our, in my view, actually gets in the way of innovation, so we celebrate the divergence. And I'll just leave you with that thought. Cease? Can I have 60 seconds? Please. I know. People want to get to the next session. Uh, I'm Cece de Oliveira. I'm from the Office of Digital Learning here at MIT. And to the questions that came up about sharing what Kathy's learning about clicker competitions or what folks in the physics department are learning about uh, flipped classrooms or whatever, we have a new feature on the OpenCourseWare site, which we started working on a couple of years ago and what we've been introducing to faculty so that we're not just publishing materials on OpenCourseWare, but we're trying to publish the teaching approaches behind it using interviews with our faculty. Uh, I, I just uh, text, texted someone on my staff about this, and they tell me they're working on a video right now about Kathy's clicker competitions, which we'll be publishing. And we will include other materials that she could provide us. So try, check out the OCW site, OCW mit.edu slash educator, and we've got a whole new portal now uh, that you can go and look at some of this stuff, but it's just at the beginning. Thank you, thank you, Cece, and it's 5111.x. Thank you very much, folks, and thank you for the panelists. Thanks very much.